Hey everyone, it's Sunday, so have an open mind, and let's listen to another point of view of things, shall we? I'll be starting off today's show with what's happening now. Sort of. Uh, today's story is related to technology in the U.S. military. The specific technology in question being the unmanned aerial vehicle, or UAV. Or, as they're more commonly referred to as, drones. Drones are basically aircraft without a human pilot on board, uh, but they can fall under two types. Uh, the autonomous aircraft, which means it would be flown by an automatic system, or the other category, which is the remotely piloted aircraft, which is more commonly employed, and uh, they're being controlled by someone not on board, but uh, somewhere else. Uh, the idea of a drone has actually been around for over a century. Uh, in the mid-1800s, Austria actually used unmanned uh, bomb-filled balloons to attack Venice. And uh, since then, they have been improved upon throughout the years. Uh, sure, many of the earlier versions weren't as effective or as accurate until after the new millennium in uh, 2000. But unmanned aircrafts as an idea aren't new. That said, drones are being used a lot more now. And the U.S. specifically has been using drones in its war against Al-Qaeda and uh, other extremist groups in the Middle East heavily these days. The results have been very deadly, and while terrorists have learned uh, to fear these unmanned flying machines of death, in many ways so have innocent bystanders. Uh, drones might take out their targets, but sometimes unintended casualties occur. A recent example of this was revealed by President Barack Obama uh, to have occurred back in January 15th of this year. Uh, in an address to the U.S. nation this past week, he stated that a drone strike that killed then Al-Qaeda leader Ahmed Farouk also resulted in the deaths of two hostages. They were U.S. consultant uh, Warren Weinstein and Italian aid worker Giovanni Loporto. There isn't much more to the story than that. I mean, it was an anti-terror operation uh, gone slightly wrong that resulted in the tragic loss of uh, two individuals. But it's more about what this story represents and the question about whether the usage of drones is worth the benefits that it raises. On the one hand, you're protecting the lives of military personnel from being in the heat of things, uh, which is a good thing, as William Sherman so eloquently put it. Uh, war is hell. If manning a drone from a secure base far away from where the action is occurring keeps a soldier away from having to experience firsthand the horror of war and from risking their life directly in case something goes wrong, uh, that's a positive thing in my book. You're, you're saving someone from uh, more trauma and uh, from risking their life directly. Uh, and like I said, drones have been producing deadly results. The drone strikes that killed uh, Anwar al-Awlaki in 2011, for ex instance, are a good example of this. Uh, then there are the other many terrorists killed by drone strikes over the years. And even this drone strike that killed the hostages also saw the Al-Qaeda leader get eliminated. So they are eliminating targets. Uh, but are those positives worth the unintended losses of life of civilians? I'm not entirely sure, to be fairly honest. Uh, I can see the merit behind both arguments, as both sides in some way or another keep someone from being at risk. But I'd very much like to know your point of view on the subject, listeners. Now then, let's turn our attention away from human violence and discuss why nature hates us. Or it at least doesn't seem to like the people of Nepal and the surrounding countries around it. A little earlier this week, Nepal was hit by a 7.8 magnitude earthquake, the effects of which were felt in various other surrounding nations and even on Mount Everest. Thus far, the casualty count is currently at 2,300 people, uh, the majority of the dead being in the country of Nepal, though some deaths from the quake occurred in India, Bangladesh, uh, China, and uh, Mount Everest, uh, mostly due to avalanches. Uh, even worse, there was a 6.7 magnitude aftershock felt in Nepal this past Saturday, 
Uh, fortunately, relief efforts are underway to assist victims of the earthquake. Uh, India, Nepal's neighbor, uh, is contributing mostly at the moment, uh, but so are nations like Sri Lanka and uh, other UN members. Uh, so things are picking up, and hopefully these people uh, recover and uh, begin rebuilding efforts as soon as possible. Alright, now then, here's a recommendation. Today's recommendation is a trilogy of books written by an author I've mentioned before in a prior edition. It's a trilogy that's been adapted into a trilogy of films. Uh, the three books are part of the Lord of the Rings trilogy and are titled The Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, and The Return of the King by J.R.R. Tolkien. It's an epic tale of fantasy about a young hobbit by the name of Frodo Baggins who alongside three hobbit friends, a wizard, a ranger, a knight, an elf, and a dwarf set out to destroy a ring. But not just any ring, but the legendary Ring of Power. Incapable of being destroyed by regular means, it can only be destroyed by the same flames from which it was forged long ago, in Mount Doom, a volcano located in the wasteland to the east, in enemy territory beyond the Black Gate. The ring is capable of corrupting even the most kind-hearted of people, and is coveted by many, including the evil Dark Lord Sauron, the original owner of the ring, who commands legions of orc armies, as well as the feared Nazgul, former kings of men corrupted by the ring to become creatures of darkness. What makes the ring so powerful? Can Frodo trust his allies to not turn on him? Will he be swayed by the ring of power? And who is Gollum? If you want to know the answers to these questions and more, then I encourage you to read the books. That said, enjoy the rest of your Sunday and have a great week.